This is T West. Welcome to Afro Synergy News and Information on Africa and the African Diaspora. At least it is showing civilian victims, but on Syrian state television, they blame those killings on so called armed terrorist groups. It's a narrative we've heard over and over from the regime. Remember, the Syrian military has once again taken control of all the neighborhoods and homes. The Assad regime is digging in, not backing down. The pictures you just saw may in fact support that assessment. In his meeting Saturday and Sunday with UN Special Envoy Kofi Annan, Syria's dictator conceded nothing, violence as if it came out of nowhere. that it's somehow just happening to the Syrian people. It is not just happening. The regime is making it happen. The violence is being done to the Syrian people, at least to Syrian Sunnis. is being inflicted on the Syrian people. And not one bit of it stopped, not for even a moment, while Kofi Annan and Assad were talking. ساعدت فرنسا وامريكا وصلت لغاز صارت عندنا وان شاء الله نحن قادرين على الشيء يعني حضرتك قصدك بالاغاثه يعني حتى نكون واضحين شوي سلاح ولا شيء ثاني ايه وصل صار في عندنا سلاح وصار في عندنا مضاد للطيران وان شاء الله هذا كله راح نقضي على بشار وعوان كل يقدر وسلاح بشار ثلاث ارباع وعاطي ما مشى حاله إن شاء الله بإذن الله تعالى من هون لعشرة أيام تسمعوا أخبار طيبة عن الجيش الحر ومن امبارح بلش الطيران ينزل الجيش الحر صار ينزل طيران امبارح نزلوا ثلاث طيارات وإن شاء الله قريبا جدا Activists say that in addition to the 45 killings in homes, the videos of which we just showed you, dozens more were killed over the weekend and many more today all across Syria. And with major shelling in homes where those bodies you saw were buried in Dara, where the regime is reportedly doing what it did against Baba Amr, the neighborhood in homes, pointing anti-aircraft artillery at houses and apartment buildings. And even though the Free Syrian Army is now fighting back, as you can see in this new video of an attack on a tank, they're no match for Assad's army, which in any case seems mainly focused on civilian targets as they did against Baba Amr. Is it even a war? I mean, is it accurate to call it that? No, I, th I, think, I think it would be wrong to call it a war. This is, this is um, I think, the overuse of medieval siege and, and slaughter. I, I would hesitate to use the word war. Slaughter. In, in Baba Amr. You say it's a slaughter. Absolutely, just a slaughter house in there. Now Syrian forces are free to go house to house, apartment to apartment, uh, and, and, and seek whatever revenge th they want. And there's really no one there anymore to document it. No international correspondence, and, and even locals with access to, to YouTube cameras and, and, and uploading things on YouTube. But first, the UN's humanitarian chief, Valerie Amos, who's just back from Syria and just back from refugee camps across Syria's border with Turkey. The Syrian government insists and has insisted for nearly a year now that 
what they call armed terrorist gangs are responsible. From what you saw, does it make any sense to you that armed terrorist gangs are capable of the wholesale destruction of Baba Amr? There had clearly been uh, heavy fighting uh, going on. Uh, any kind of uh, opposition or armed gang would have had to have uh, the uh, considerable weapons at their disposal. You met with the, the foreign minister, other members of the Assad regime. How, how do they, I mean, in private, do they actually use this same rhetoric of armed terrorist gangs? I mean, do, do they really seem to believe that? All of the ministers that I met uh, made it clear that uh, the Syrian government uh, was fighting uh, terrorism. Uh, they were fighting uh, people who wanted to see regime uh, change in uh, the country uh, and also made the point that they did not think that there were significant humanitarian needs in the country. How can they say that there's not you know, significant humanitarian needs in the country. I mean, we, we've seen with our own eyes in countless videos the shelling of, of Baba Amr. We've seen the, uh, what, what other, what independent reporters uh, who I've talked to have called the wholesale slaughter of people there. I'm really worried about what has happened to the people of uh, Baba Amr because there was no one around. It was pretty much uh, deserted. Thousands of people have been displaced. We don't know how many people have been wounded. We don't know uh, where those people have gone or indeed what their needs are. So uh, my view is that there are humanitarian needs in uh, Syria and I'd like us to be able to find out more about exactly what those needs are and how we can help. As you know, the Syrians, uh, there are a lot of Syrians uh, who watch this program who, who will say that the Assad regime is basically just buying time. They're just using you, they're using Kofi Annan, they're using the UN, they'll have meetings, they'll they'll you know make pronouncements what, what they want is basically just buying time to slaughter people on the ground what do you need to see what, what is your timetable for action by the Syrian regime in order to prove that they are serious about meeting the humanitarian needs of the people well what I uh, heard from the Syrian government in terms of their proposal to me to conduct these assessments is that they should start within a week of my visit that means Thursday of this week. That is what we are planning for. I, I know you're, you're in a difficult position. You have to deal with these people and meet with these people. But I, I guess fr from an outsider's perspective, if they don't allow the Red Crescent into Baba Amr in the days after they have been shelling it for weeks and weeks and weeks, and we know that there are desperate, desperately injured people there who are afraid to go to government-run hospitals, there's, there's little medicine, there's been little food getting in. If the Syrian regime refuses to allow the Red Crescent in immediately to, to bring in humanitarian supplies, why should anyone believe that a week from now or two weeks from now they're going to kind of help you do an assessment of the needs of the people? Won't, won't a lot of the people already be dead? My job is to keep trying. My job is to try as hard as we can to get the help to the people who need it. My job is not to give up. Uh, Valerie Amos, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to bring in photojournalist Paul Conroy, who was wounded in the siege of Babur Amr in the same attack that took the lives of his colleague uh, Marie uh, Colvin uh, and Remy Oshlik. He joins us by phone. Also, Fawad Ajami, senior fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Um, You know, Fawad, uh, Valerie Amos is obviously in a difficult position, seems like a nice person, but... It's, it's kind of ridiculous to be going through this facade where... She's saying, well, there's this timetable, we want them to bring in humanitarian relief. They've been shelling this city for a month now, killing countless numbers of people, and then they won't even allow in the Red Crescent Society to bring in humanitarian relief when it's most needed. Well, what's interesting is, I think I was listening carefully to you, and you said that all this is buying time, which is very interesting and very compelling. There is a 22-year-old protester in Syria who was quoted in the New York Times saying, the world is buying time. 
by sending more delegations and envoys. Kofi Annan will do nothing, and Valerie Amos will do nothing. And these are very weak people because they understand the brief they are given by the United Nations. They understand the abdication at the United Nations, and they understand the abdication of American power, which is hiding behind the Russian veto, to be honest with you. We keep going to the UN, and we send them Kofi Annan, one of the most morally compromised bureaucrats in the international order, with his reputation sullied in Rwanda, with his reputation questioned in Bosnia, with his reputation again questioned in the oil for food program over Iraq, and he walks in like this innocent man, thinking that there is peace and love to be disposed, dispensed around in Syria. The Syrian regime's claims of armed terrorist gangs just seems absurd to me. But look, the UN is a really irrelevant. I mean, I think we're focus when we talk about the UN, we're focusing on the wrong players. It's the powers, the democracies, the so-called friends of Syria. It's basically what will the U.S. do? What will Britain do? What will France do? What will the moderate Arab governments with their money and support, alleged support for the Syrian people? What will they do? So we go to the United Nations. It's a cul-de-sac. When you go to the UN, you already are going to face these obstacles at the UN, the Russians, the Chinese, other powers. Thank you.